Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Amanda Marcotta. My guest today is Rebecca Traster. She's a writer at large for New York Magazine and the author of a new book called Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. So a well-timed book. Welcome As it to... turns out, yes. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on to Salon Talks, Thank uh, you Rebecca. so much for having me. So, so I like this book a lot because it was very much, um, very personal. It felt very raw and real, and it was very much of our generation, Generation mm. X. I felt like yeah, in the a lot in of between, ways. looking at the past and the younger, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you wrote in the book about how I think our generation really felt like a feminist felt a lot of pressure to be fun and ironic and kind of wry, and like that's being stripped away, and. I, I kind of want to ask you about then first. Mm -hmm. Why did you? Why do you think there was so much pressure on women to be chill about our feminism? Well, it's really hard to describe. Are we? You're younger than me. I'm 43. Not by much. Okay. All right. So I would imagine that you have some of the same memories that I have, and you also come from Texas. So I do not come from Texas, but I would suspect that it was even more deep freeze anti-feminist backlash era. You know, growing up, um, I. I, it's hard sometimes to explain to younger people, and there's no reason that they should know, right? It's just like when you're trying to describe your perspective and what, what you came out of, how intense the anti-feminist backlash of the 1980s and 90s was. To anybody who's come of age within a feminist blogosphere, right? Yeah. Oh, really over the past 15 years almost, there's no way to describe it was a desert. Right? Yeah. There was there was a zine culture. There were there was feminism certainly at the margins. There was there were riot girls and zines and and um, there were journalists like Kath Pollitt. Um, there were certainly feminist there was femi feminist scholarship in the academy. But in terms of any popular mainstream media, and certainly in pop culture on television, any form of the news that you were getting. <laughs> It was to there were there, feminism was simply frozen. It was a tundra, <laughs> and so I have very distinct memories as a young journalist. It never would have occurred to me there was no category like feminist journalist. You know, the mm -hmm. job I have now was not one I could have imagined, not only when I was a child but as a teenager. So I got to be part of a generation along with you and you know dozens of our peers and colleagues who started to populate the internet and like <laughs> um, with the feminist media and we were making it up out of out of a frozen tundra we were like popping heads out and being like feminism i think we should talk about it again <laughs> <laughs> and and there was a, an acute awareness for anyone who was raised with this sense of impossibility of having a robust feminist conversation um, i think there was an and I can only speak for myself here, there was a desire to distance ourselves, myself, from the, the sort of negative caricatures of feminism past. And a lot of those that had, had adhered dishonestly were, you know, man-hating, sexless, um, humorless, right? All that stuff that had been attached dishonestly. Um, to feminism of the of the second wave of the 1970s, and so I think there was a lot of self-conscious um, work to make a new feminist conversation palatable yeah. and inviting to lots of people and sexy and fun and and you know I participated in this to different degrees and I by the way I don't think it was an error I actually don't think it was an error yeah. I. You know, the stripping away of some of that veneer of palatability, I think, is incredibly important and crucial to the growth of a feminist conversation and, and having it drill down um, to realer places. <laughs> but I think there was a profound use in bringing it back in a way that probably did make certain compromises with a general aesthetic um, set of expectations in order to engage in a broad popular conversa conversation about gender that invited a lot of people in to start talking about inequality in ways that they hadn't for decades. Then we start talking about it and people get awakened more fully, the conversation becomes more nuanced, um, angrier to some extent, and it's perfectly reasonable to go back and critique those early iterations, those, you know, the, the sort of prettied up versions um, that were made slick and, and digestible, and that's, that's fine too, right? Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. defend against it exactly, except to say that I, I participated then and I, I participate now in the critique of some of the ways that we prettied up our anger. I mean, I think, 
And, and maybe one thing that's changed, it seems to me, is that, you know, it seemed back then you had to be funny to be disarming. And now people, women are using their humor to be even angrier and even scarier. Yes, yes I think that's right. I think that's really smart. Um, so what, I mean, what do you think changed? What do you think changed that made women just so angry in the past couple of years? Well, I think it was the sort of, one of the challenges about being angry, about um, misogyny, about racism, about economic inequality, um, is that there's a constant message in the United States that we don't really have anything to be angry about. <laughs> right? And that is, and it's always easier to like pat ourselves on the back and be like, no, we fix those problems and we don't have, because it's really hard. It's hard to be engaged in these fights. Um, and I think that especially during an Obama administration, I mean, coming out of, a, of backlash years, um, you saw the bubblings of all kinds of anger. There was Occupy, um, Black Lives Matter. On the right, there's the Tea Party. Like there, there, you know, there's there's anger coming from several directions, like grassroots anger. Um, but especially for those of us on the left, and in, really engaged in a feminist conversation, a conversation about racism, there was a lot of messaging during the two Obama terms that look. We have, an Obama, we have an Obama administration. Hillary Clinton is inevitably going to be our next president. It's, in fact, you can't, you, you can't be mad on these grounds, really, um, because, in fact, the woman is the one who has the most power. She is the one who is the abuser of the power, right? She's the system, and those who are challenging her are the outliers. Like, your, any feminist anger on her behalf is illegitimate on yeah. its face. And there are complicated there are complicated reasons that that argument was made. Hillary Clinton had accrued a lot of power. She had ascended within a white patriarchal party system, political system, to be able to be the first woman ever nominated by a major party to the presidency. So the, those arguments weren't totally invalid, but they did work to quell any sense of like there's, you know, a real reason for feminist complaint. There was there was sort of similar stuff happening around race during the Obama administration. Black Lives Matter comes up in the midst of that, and that is really the thing that begins to crack that open as far as mass mass rage goes. And that, of course, is a movement that is founded by and, and led by many black women, um, very consciously so. So, um, but the thing that happened during the 2016 election and then with the election of Donald Trump is that all of the messages about how, no, 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 you really have, you have all the power, there's nothing to be angry about. Um, your feminist argument is fundamentally illegitimate because it's a woman who is the, you know, the, the system, the power, you know, who's rigging it all against the rest of us. The win of Donald Trump, the victory of Donald Trump, um, I think, made that Im argument impossible to make. All of a sudden, it sort of stripped off the veneer of, you know, your feminism is, has, has become illegitimate because now women have accru accrued so much power within this flawed system, right? Even within the system in which they'd accrued power, they still actually <laughs> couldn't win. <laughs> and, and no, it's not just because she was a woman, it's not just because of sexism, but it's also impossible to take gender out of you know, how Hillary Clinton had gotten there and how Donald Trump had worked to beat her. So you can't tell that story without talking about, without talking about sexism and racism. When you can't bullshit women anymore about that. Like, I right. think that's like a huge right. part of it. You're like, well, it's about something other than this. And you're like, well, look at him and look at her. Come right. on. Right, right. Well, the, the setup was so classic. It was truly like, I, I mean, and I, I have written this, but it's true. It was like a 1980s boardroom comedy. Like, <laughs> whatever you think of Hillary Clinton, here was this wildly prepared, competent, extremely smart woman, better qualified for this job than, than any previous applicant for it. <laughs> and, and she's leapfrogged by the incompetent fucking toddler who'd already been reported to HR, and he gets the promotion. <laughs> like, that is, that was a story that resonated for millions of women, whether they liked Hillary Clinton or not, or whether they were, like, passionately drawn to her campaign, because it was like, oh, no, that shit is what happens at my office, yeah. <laughs> right? And I, but that's, that's really crucial. And by the way, those politics of, um, of, of race and, and even the most powerful, the, the women who basically have won patriarchy, white patriarchy, those have also come into play several other times over the past couple of years. It is, we've, I've talked and written quite a bit about 
how Me Too comes into being in its hashtag form, in its hashtag movement form in the, in the fall of 2017, exactly a year ago, in part because the women who are lodging the initial big complaints are extremely wealthy, white, cisgendered actresses, um, yeah. women who'd been held up as a kind of feminine ideal in this country within the industry in which they worked. These were women who also had accrued power and risen up within a system that, you know, some of us would argue like is simultaneously oppressing them, but you could say, how are they being oppressed? They're, you know, bajillion dollar earning actresses. But then the revelation that they too had in fact been assaulted, um, had violence done to them, that it had had a detrimental and systemic impact on their careers. Um, that was like, oh my God, if even the ones who are the most powerful yeah. can have experienced this kind of misogyny, then misogyny must be real. Now there are really complicated realities about the fact that that's how we're able to finally discern misogyny and that we're not hearing it in the same way. McDonald's workers just went on strike. Um, last week, you know, that we, there wasn't the same kind of attention paid to the stories in the Times about the Ford factory workers. The Huffington Post did great reporting on sexual harassment in the, in the airline industry to flight attendants, hotel workers, the farm workers, the Latina farm workers who came out in solidarity with the actresses. There wasn't that same kind of attention to those women who have so much less economic and racial power. Um, and that we need to talk about that, but it is also true that it was the fact that they had so much power that I think um, contributed to the breadth of the message getting getting spread. And in all this sort of, I think, brings us to, of course, the topic du jour, which is um, Brett Kavanaugh's nomination mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court, and the fact that Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who spoke out against him, is one of those powerful white mm -hmm. privileged women. I, I mean, what are your thoughts about how this is all playing out? Well, I think that that's another, that's a point along that same continuum. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot with regard to Dr. Christine Blasey Ford in contrast to Anita Hill, who, who has always said she has written about the sort of it, how she was incomprehensible to the white, all white, all male Senate judiciary both Democrats and Republicans at that time were all white and all male in 1991, in part because her credentials didn't quite match up with how they understood black femininity, that yeah. she was separate from both the patronage system and the institution of marriage as an unmarried woman, and therefore was kind of inscrutable, like totally, they couldn't, they didn't know what to make of her. Um, and that that contributed to her treatment as crazy, the writing her off as an erotomaniac, and that she was a fantasist, um, desperate, single, lonely, all the horrible ways in which she was treated. And I kept thinking about Anita Hill and that what she perceived of that as her incomprehensibility um, versus Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, who is by every measure married, white, middle-aged, suburban woman, um, comprehensible yeah. as female within a white capitalist patriarchy, right? And yet, she is actually, I mean, she's treated, I would say, with like a degree more respect, sort of conversant respect, like they know better, in part because they hire a woman to do the talking to her so that they don't, so that the Republican men don't actually have to talk to her. And um, there is a more uh, respectful and diverse bench um, on the Democratic side, so there's not that dual treatment. But in terms of how they actually handled the case, how the Senate judiciary handled the case from an institutional perspective, it has perhaps been handled worse, if that is even possible. I have grown up, Anita Hill's testimony was like a, a fulcrum yeah. turning point for me. I have grown up thinking that that was the floor <laughs> of, of yeah. institutional turned handling, out no. <laughs> it turned out, no, that from an institutional perspective, this could be handled worse by a Senate judiciary, because that is what has happened with, with Christine Blasey Ford. I mean, obviously, like, the, the elephant in the room on the difference is that the Democrats controlled the Senate Judiciary right. Committee in 1991, and, and they and, did a and terrible did a job. job, right? And I think if they controlled it now, they would do a significantly better job. Yes, because yes. Of, the party has changed even since then, but part of it is just that the Republicans have doubled down. I mean, what do you think that's about? It's about re retaining this desperate grip on power, 
right? So much of what we're seeing, the election of Donald Trump, the enthusiasm for him, the sort of fever for like make America great again, like there's, this is all code. We know what it's code for. It's not, even, it's not even a secret. Donald Trump has stripped it of its window dressing. And in fact, the treatment of Dr. Blasey Ford is also stripped of its window dressing. Like nobody's even pretending to really care. They like pay a couple sentences of lip service. Um, you know, we've heard her and sorry for what you've been through. But they're also talking about her as, uh, you know, the women making accusations about Brett Kavanaugh as, you know, smear jobs, con jobs. Donald Trump talked about them as being paid off. There's not even, they're not even trying. Yeah. There's just a sense, there's like the, the aggrieved, and, and it actually stands in for the bigger thing that they're angry about. The anger expressed by Lindsey Graham and Brett Kavanaugh, which is the anger of like, you're trying to interfere with our further accrual of federal institutional power. That's what's happening here. That's actually the far broader story about um, those in political power in the United States. In the, in the face of the fear, by the way, they shouldn't be that panicked, right? <laughs> that, <laughs> that it's sort of a, a population, uh, unlike the population that has historically had a near exclusive grip on economic, sexual, social, professional, political power in this country. The fear that that power is, they're going to be forced to share it and lose status and have their grip on power um, diminished in some way has prompted this kind of fevered anger. Like, you can't do this to me. This is an outrage. This is an outrage. That's like, it's basically the whole Donald Trump campaign. It's, yeah. it's the, you know, it's the roots of how he began his life as a politician, you know, by, by questioning Barack Obama's legitimacy. Like, this is impossible that this black man could be the president. Yeah. Right? He's yeah. fundamentally illegitimate as in this job. That is how Donald Trump became president. That's how he launched himself here. And it all stems from this same sense of like, you people, something that Orrin Hatch said in two instances during these hearings. First, he said, before the allegations, the assault allegations had been made, just responding to the protesters, there were one, I, I, I loved the protesters who came to the first yeah. round of Kavanaugh hearings because it was like anger was this renewable resource. Women would get up, they would yell, they'd scream, they'd be taken out, arrested, and then more women would get up and yell. And I was like, oh my God, these women are heroes, and they are. Um, but one thing, Orrin Hatch had this locution. He, was, he responded to a woman in that first week who was yelling about how if healthcare reform were repealed, she would die. That was yeah. what she was yelling about from the back. And he said, can't we have this loud mouth removed? And this, I write in my book all about how the great threat of, of an angry woman is always represented by a woman with her mouth open saying something and the yeah. degrees to which we have worked to close women's mouths. Um, so he calls her a loud mouth. And then he says, we shouldn't have to put up with this. Yeah. Now, he said the exact same thing three weeks later, talking to reporters in the Senate building about these accusations being made against his Supreme Court candidate. And he said, we shouldn't have to put up with this. And that sums it up for me. That is, that's it. That's stripped of its window dressing. Yeah. We, the men in power, me, Orrin Hatch, who has had the same goddamn seat on the Senate Judiciary Committee since 1991 when I treated Anita Hill like shit, um, we shouldn't have to put up with challenges to our power. We shouldn't have to put up with repercussions. We shouldn't have to put up with consequences or with anybody interfering with our ability to, to exert authority over this nation. And it, it really is fascinating because it's like, I think that explains so much of the gap that you, per, that you perceive between their viewpoint and like, I'd say our viewpoint, mm -hmm. right? Which is like, we're like, you guys are still going to have 75% of the power, but right. even 25%. <laughs> Even 25% lost has created things like repercussions for sexual harassment, has created things like having this hearing in the first place. Right. Here's the thing. Every tiny loss, it really gives you an idea of the, the level of, I don't know whether it's pettiness or greed or the degree to which they're used to sort of an all-encompassing power. Because we really are talking about losses that are by degree, right? So even if Kavanaugh had withdrawn, they have a lineup. <laughs> of people who are going to do the same job that he's going to do. They're going to yeah. overturn Roe v. Wade. They're going to gut collective bargaining rights. They're going to reverse affirmative action. They're actually going to work the mechanisms to be able to suppress dissent and the power that it might have through social change and through transformative political mo movements. 
Um, you got, I can, I can read you the names of 20 of these people who the Federalist Society has already approved. They're going to get their Supreme Court justice, right? It's, it's truly they can't stand the loss. Yeah. They can't stand that this would set a precedent where just because you assaulted some woman when you were, uh, you know, able-bodied, young, drunken man at an elite prep school, well, God damn it, if you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, you, the rhetoric coming from Republicans are like, well, if we're going to start coming after every man who's done this, right, there it is. Yeah. You strip the window dressing, right? We assume that actually the abuse of power is tied so closely to having power that you're talking about their entire view of what power means. Yeah which is connected to being able to do things to, to bodies that have less power that are, that are in some way vulnerable to you without ever having to pay for it or answer for it. That's been the history of powerful white men in American politics and American business and in lots of American homes for a long time. And, um, you know, and, and it's, they can't stand even a small chink in that power. And I think, that that, I think you could say the same thing about the degree to which the Obama presidency, which is we're talking about... One percent, two percent of American presidents, right? Like one person who wasn't a white man. Yeah. And, and still a man. And it was, and he's still a man. But it was so intolerable that the fury that built that kind of, you know, I still think all the time of Jan Brewer sticking her yes. finger oh in God. Obama's face and you lie. And, you know, the kind of open disrespect um, that would, that, that, they just felt able to show this person. It remind, I thought of it the other day when Brett Kavanaugh said to Amy, Amy Klobuchar, like, have you ever blacked out? And I was like, oh, my God. This is, it's that same thing. It's like Jan Brewer pointing her finger at Barack Obama. Like, you're not supposed to have power over me. Yeah. And um, it's also one of the reasons that I was so moved by the two women confronting Jeff Flake. And one of them, I, I think it was Maria Gallagher, pointed her finger <laughs> At Jeff Flake, and I was like, yeah, that nah, a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Man, there are so many more questions I want to ask you, but I think we are close okay. to out of time. But I do want to ask you one more thing. Um, because of all this women's anger, the Women's March, the Me Too movement, we're starting to get those concerned voices back. The women's anger is dangerous for us. We will, we will be hearing that to the end of time. But you write, um, quote, that writing this book was one of the, most, one of the physically healthiest periods of my adulthood. Um, is anger actually good for us? If we were, I had a perfect test tube experience with getting to voice my anger. And I don't make any bones about that in the book. I can't recommend it as a health regime to anybody else because I had this unique, I was like an anger biodome, right? <laughs> like I had to write the book very quickly. It was four months. My editors were so, I was being paid for it, right? I was profiting from getting to be angry. I had editors and readers, my friend, you know, the, the people who were sort of my support system, who were anxious to take what I was saying on the subject seriously. There was nobody, there, were no, there weren't even reviews yet. Do you know what I mean? And right. I had this perfect experience of getting to take other women's rage seriously, getting to put my rage to unapologetic use, put it on the page. And yes, it was truly of my adulthood, probably in some ways the healthiest time I've ever had. And it did make me think everything I've been told about how it's the anger that's corrosive, the anger that raises your blood pressure, the anger that makes you sick and hunched. Like, I think that's wrong. I think it's the bottle, I think it's the suppression of the anger that causes so many of those problems. However, having said that, I don't want anybody to think that I, in any good faith, could recommend, like, you should go out and do this because there are penalties that, that women pay, that people of color pay. Um, for expressing angry dissent that are very real. And most people don't get to have that anger biodome that I got for four months. I included that in the book largely because I wanted to say like, oh my God, I've been to this crazy place <laughs> where, where anger is, is taken seriously and I, I'm free to express it without any repercussion. In fact, with encouragement and respect, like to be met with respect and it feels great, <laughs> but it's like truly like I visited another universe. It's not like I'm saying everybody go do this because you're not going to be met with that same respect. And that's the thing we have to change. That's why we have to start affording other women that kind of respect, encouragement, you know, and, and money for their anger, right? Like the, to take them politically seriously and acknowledge the, the political consequence and, 
and um, seriousness of their fury. And that's the system we have to change. Thank you so much. Thank My you. guest today has been Rebecca Traster. The book is called Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger. And again, thanks for being on Salon Talks. Thank you so much, Amanda.